Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. By Ken Kesey. Ken Kesey's novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was published in 1962. While working as an orderly in a psychiatric ward and taking part in LSD trials, Kesey penned the novel. The novel was a smash hit, and it was made into a Broadway play in 1963 and a feature film in 1975. The picture, which starred Jack Nicholson as the primary protagonist Randall McMurphy, won five Academy Awards. It's still considered a classic film today. The novel's plot is told through the eyes of a patient in a psychiatric facility, a huge Native American man named Chief Bromden. Bromden has hallucinations and is frequently hired to clean the ward. The staff and other patients incorrectly believe he is deaf and dumb. McMurphy, a new patient, is admitted to the ward one day. McMurphy fights with the ward's head nurse, the severe and nasty nurse Ratchet, right away. McMurphy is apprehended after a daring escape attempt and subjected to electroshock therapy and a lobotomy. Bromden puts him in a vegetative condition and smothers him in his bed to put him out of his agony. Bromden then flees the ward and travels north to Canada. The novel is narrated by a patient named Chief Bromden. Bromden is a mute Native American guy who has spent many years in a psychiatric facility. He is permitted to sweep the floors as a long-term patient who consistently demonstrates good behavior. Most residents and personnel in the ward believe Bromden is deaf and deafeningly 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 dea. Nurse Ratched walks in. She is a powerful woman that Bromden regards as mechanical and harsh. She directs that Bromden be shaved. He protests and tries to flee, but he is eventually apprehended and medicated forcibly. While being shaved, he begins to have hallucinations that he is surrounded by fog created by machines, till he eventually loses consciousness. Bromden wakes up in the bright day room. He is relieved to learn that he has not been taken to the shock shop or the place where electroshock therapy is administered to victims. As he awakens, he notices a new patient being in. Randall McMurphy, the patient, is a rowdy Irishman who informs the other patients he is a gambler and pulls a pack of cards from his pocket. Nurse Ratchet insists that he be showered, but McMurphy dismisses her, claiming that he has already been showered for the courthouse and the jail and that he is as clean as can be. McMurphy boasts to the others that he is a psychopath, while Bromden believes he exudes sanity. The younger, newer patients on the ward are referred to as acutes by the doctor since they are noted to have mental disorders that are more transient and aren't expected to be in the ward for long. Chronic patients are those who have been hospitalized for an extended period of time. They are unlikely to heal and reintegrate into society. Among the chronics are walkers who can roam around the ward, such as Bromden, and vegetables who are restricted to their beds. Many of the vegetables were mentally handicapped as a result of the excessive use of shock therapy. McMurphy casually asks the acutes who their leader is. That is, those they consider to be the most mentally unwell. Billy Bippet, a young man with a stutter, introduces McMurphy to Harding, the head of the patient's council. Harding is a college graduate who is 31 years old. McMurphy argues that he is now the craziest person on the ward and that Harding must make way for him. Harding does step aside after a brief competition and McMurphy presents himself to everyone in the ward. When he notices Bromden, Harding warns him that he is deaf and dumb. Nurse Ratched prepares her hypodermic needles in another room. Another nurse approaches her and asks what she thinks about McMurphy. Ratched is adamant that McMurphy is a manipulator out to destabilize the ward. Ratched, according to Bromden, rules the ward like a dictatorship. She is excruciatingly rigorous and follows an oppressively tight schedule. Her servants were picked for their brutality or submissiveness. Bromden refers to the unit as the combine, since patients are brought in just to be processed and mentally annihilated. She encourages the acutes to spy on one another and rewards them for whatever information they provide her about other patients. Ratched has also formed a gang of henchmen among her orderlies. Bromden refers to the orderlies, a group of three black males, as the black boys. Mr. Tabor, a patient, demands to know what is in the prescription Ratchet is giving him that morning. She gently declines to tell him and then warns him that if he refuses to take his medication orally, there are other options. The black boys kidnap him. Nurse Ratchet convenes a ward meeting later that day. Except for McMurphy, who still possesses his deck of cards, none of the patients will look Ratchet in the eyes. She begins the discussion by discussing Harding's marital issues. McMurphy makes multiple filthy comments that irritate Ratchet so she responds by reading his medical records aloud. She is preoccupied with his arrest for statutory rape. 
McMurphy avoids this by telling the group about his 15-year-old past lover. Dr. Spivey, a nearby doctor, informs Wretched that McMurphy may be pretending to be insane in order to avoid returning to the farm where he works. Ratched brings up the concept of a therapeutic community, which holds that before a person can function successfully in society, he must learn to get along with a community of like-minded people. McMurphy has an answer for anything Nurse Ratched says. This starts to irritate her. After the meeting, McMurphy inquires whether the meetings are always conducted in this manner, with the patients urged to confess their misdeeds to one another. Nurse Ratched, according to Harding, is not a monster, but she is rigorous. Ratchet, according to McMurphy, has him by the balls. Harding disputes this, claiming that Ratchet is a merciful and selfless angel. But, eventually, Harding relents and admits that McMurphy is correct, but that no one ever says anything unpleasant about Ratchet aloud. Harding claims that Dr. Spivey is terrified of Nurse Ratchet. Nurse Ratchet is compared to a wolf by Harding, who compares all of the patients to rabbits. Ratchet, according to Harding, employs electroshock therapy intimidation, and domination to control the victims. McMurphy informs the patients that he believes they are all sane and could leave the ward. He bets the others that he can crack Nurse Ratchet in a week. Part 2 begins with Bromden describing how Ratchet can set the clock on the wall to any speed she wants and how she habitually slows it down to confuse the patients and keep them at her mercy. She also maintains the speakers on the wall constantly playing music. Harding tells McMurphy that she never allows the patients to hear the news through the speakers because she believes it will upset them. McMurphy puts Bromed into the test about this time by insisting that the orderlies are coming for him. McMurphy realizes Bromed is not deaf after he jumps at the news. For the first time in a long time, Bromed falls asleep without the need of drugs that night. He has a nightmare in which one of the veggies, a man named Blastic, is hanged up on a hook and cut open by the orderlies. Rust and glass, however, stream from him instead of blood. The contents of a malfunctioning machine. Bromden awakens in a cold sweat. The next morning, he notices McMurphy singing loudly. Bromden is perplexed as to why the orderlies are letting him to do this. He believes McMurphy has not yet been gnashed up by the combine. McMurphy asks one of the patients for toothpaste to brush his teeth and is told by Ratchet that the toothpaste is locked up and may only be used at specific times. The orderlies inform Ratchet that McMurphy is causing trouble and that Blastic died the night before, proving to Bromden that his dream was at least partially accurate. McMurphy spends his mornings goofing off and being deliberately antagonistic. He makes fun of Billy Bibbit and tosses butter at the renowned wall clock. Dr. Spivey shows up for an interview with McMurphy. Spivey tells the patients that he and McMurphy went to the same high school, and they start talking about the school carnivals. Spivey suggests to the other patients that they hold a similar carnival on the ward. Nurse Ratchet is enraged, and Bromden notices her hands shaking despite her lack of resistance. He realizes she has the ability to mobilize the entire ward to oppose the idea. Despite what the orderlies and Nurse Ratchet do to provoke McMurphy, he maintains a light-hearted demeanor. He spends the following few days monopolizing the patients. He becomes irritated and chastises the other patients for being cowardly during a group meeting. He wished to rearrange the cleaning schedule so that the men could watch the World Series during the day. He expected nurses to oppose the concept, but the rest of the acute stew as well. This enrages McMurphy, who declares that he intends to flee the ward by hurling the control panel in the bathroom through a window. He tries to lift the panel, but it is simply too heavy for him. Bromden still sees a fog over the rooms, but he claims it makes him feel safe. He believes McMurphy is attempting to bring himself and the other patients out of the fog where they are in danger. He believes the fog is caused by fog machines he seen during the Korean War. The machines were designed to hide the soldiers' surroundings so that no one could see what they were doing. Bromden recalls getting lost in the fog and ending up right back where he started. He wonders when Ratchet will put them back in the fog. Bromden overhears the administrators discussing a patient double drawler who recently committed suicide. McMurphy brings up the World Series again at the next group meeting and Ratched reluctantly permits the patients to vote on it. McMurphy gets all of the acutes to vote for him, but Ratched maintains that this is insufficient and that none of the chronics voted for him. McMurphy accepts the challenge and attempts to get at least one habitual voter to vote for him. Bromden is the only one he can persuade to raise their hand, but Ratched maintains that the conference has already concluded and that the vote was invalid. When the World Series starts, McMurphy stops working and turns on the television. Nurse Ratchet becomes enraged and turns it off. 
She begins to chastise McMurphy, but the other acutes and Bromden encircle him and sit down to watch the game as well. Bromden overhears doctors and nurses discussing McMurphy and his impact on the other patients. Some believe he is too cunning to be truly mentally ill, while others believe he is sick and may even be dangerous. One doctor in particular is concerned that McMurphy may assault him. Ratchet assuages their anxieties by emphasizing that McMurphy is not unusual or special in any manner, but rather a man who can be controlled. Ratchet also points out that McMurphy was confined involuntarily, which means they have all the time in the world to break him. The other patients praise McMurphy on winning the bet and causing Ratchet to lose her temper. As a result of her victory, McMurphy becomes more daring with Ratchet over the next few days, asking her more probing, sarcastic questions than ever before. Bromden begins to believe that McMurphy is powerful enough to escape the Combine. At the next group meeting, the patients begin to bring up more long-standing grievances that they had previously had to keep quiet about. McMurphy notices that Ratchet is still acting as though she is hiding something from the rest of them. McMurphy talks with a lifeguard when the patients visit a nearby pool. McMurphy claims that being in the ward is equivalent to being in prison. The lifeguard, who is also a sufferer, claims that it is much worse because you have a release date in prison. He informs McMurphy that he will stay as long as Ratchet wants. With this in mind, McMurphy begins to act better that evening than he had in the previous few days. During group sessions, he ceases grumbling and protesting. The ward's rigorously regimented daily existence resumes as McMurphy begins to act better in order to give in to Ratchet. Everything returns to how it was before he was brought in. Harding's wife frequently visits the ward, and the two argue about trivial matters. His wife, Vera, begins to flirt with McMurphy before abruptly leaving. Harding asks McMurphy what he thought of Vera when she leaves, and McMurphy laughs that he liked her figure. Harding is angry, but McMurphy assures him that he is preoccupied with his own problems and cannot think of anyone else. The patients are brought to another facility for chest x-rays one day. While waiting, McMurphy asks the others why they didn't notify him that Ratchet would decide whether or not he could leave. Harding acknowledges that he had forgotten McMurphy had been committed involuntarily. There were not many involuntarily committed inmates on the ward. These are just a few of the older chronics. McMurphy asks Billy why he's there if he doesn't have to be, and Billy answers he's too weak to leave and starts crying as the scabs on his wrists open and bleed. The patients return to the ward and attempt to reassure Billy. Bromden notices McMurphy is concerned. That afternoon, another meeting is conducted, where Ratchet discusses the group's actions during the World Series. She acknowledges that she has delayed much too long to confront it and wishes to give the men an opportunity to apologize. She has revoked access to the tub room, claiming that it is for the patient's own good. McMurphy stands up and walks over to the nurse's station without saying anything. He punches the glass and rudely remarks that it was so clean that he didn't notice it. McMurphy goes unpunished after this incident because Ratchet knows she has all the time in the world to torture him. When McMurphy doesn't get his way the first time, he breaks the glass in the nurse's station again. The other acutes begin to follow his lead and become more aggressive. McMurphy begins organizing a fishing trip for the patients, and Bromden realizes he wants to go, but he does not want the nurses to notice that he can hear the others discussing the trip. He adds that over time, everyone on the ward began to assume he was deaf despite his lack of communication. McMurphy offers Bromden a pack of gum one night, and Bromden tries to say thank you. McMurphy tells Bromden that he used to work picking beans on a farm. He worked hard and never said anything to the grown-ups with whom he worked, but he listened to everything they said to him. On his last day there, he reported what he had heard, causing a commotion. McMurphy wonders if this is what Bromden has in mind. Bromden, on the other hand, informs McMurphy that he could never do that because he is not bold enough. McMurphy wonders if Bromden, who is bigger and stronger, could lift the control panel in the tub room. He suggests that Bromden break out of the ward. Ratchet starts planning her next move in the confrontation with McMurphy. She arranges a conference in which she informs the other patients that McMurphy has been taking money from them. Because of the recent fishing excursion and other minor arrangements made by McMurphy, the patients begin to worry if she is telling the truth. Bromden grows suspicious and advises McMurphy that the other patients are beginning to doubt McMurphy's ability to win best against them and have reasons for collecting their money. The orderlies spray down the prisoners as they line up naked against the wall. McMurphy stands up for a patient who refuses to be cleansed, and one of the orderlies punches him in the face. A battle breaks out. One of the orderlies manages to flee and seek assistance. McMurphy and Bromden are being sent to the disturbed ward. 
McMurphy and Bromden are subjected to electroshock treatment the following morning. That week, McMurphy has numerous additional electroshock treatments. Bromden tries to persuade him to give up his pride in order for Nurse Ratched to admit him back to the normal ward. Bromden returns to the main ward before McMurphy and discovers he has become something of a legend for surviving so much electroshock. Ratched recognizes that the other patients looking up to McMurphy are harmful to her and quickly returns him to the ward. Ratched suggests performing a surgery on McMurphy but does not elaborate. Fearing about McMurphy's safety, the other patients decide to break him out of the ward. However, the orderlies catch them in the act as they carry out their plan. McMurphy strikes Ratched after they are all taken back into the ward, shredding her uniform. The orderlies successfully remove him from her. Dr. Spivey resigns that night, and several of the voluntary patients sign themselves out of the ward. Nurse Ratched is sent to the hospital for treatment of the wounds caused by McMurphy's attempt to strangle her, and another nurse runs the ward. When Ratched returns, Harding inquires as to when McMurphy will be returned. She is unable to talk, so she writes on a notepad that he will return shortly. Harding dismisses her as a liar and signs himself out of the ward. Ratched is having difficulty getting her ward back into shape. McMurphy is brought back three weeks after his attempted escape. He has been lobotomized and is not a vegetable in a wheelchair. Bromden resolves to put McMurphy out of his misery by smothering him with a pillow in the middle of the night. McMurphy is brought back three weeks after his attempted escape. He has been lobotomized and is not a vegetable in a wheelchair. Bromden resolves to put McMurphy out of his misery by smothering him with a pillow in the middle of the night. The following day, Bromden removes the control panel from the tub room and throws it out the window. He flees and takes a ride north hoping to make it to Canada. Chief Bromden, a chronic patient at the ward who has been there for years. Bromden is the story's narrator and a very huge Native American man. The other patients on the hospital have been taught to believe that Bromden is deaf and deafeningly 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 deaf. The plot of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is about McMurphy's time in the hospital, but as told by Bromden, it is also about his own journey back to sanity. Bromden depicts his own hallucinations as a fog that he sees drifting over himself and other patients at the start of the story. The fog is a relic of Bromden's service in the army. The military would frequently employ fog to conceal their most heinous crime. The fog in the novel reflects the combination of drugs and electroshock treatment used by the physicians and Ratched to keep their patients docile and controlled. The fog surrounding Bromden has cleared by the end of the novel, and he is able to find his way back to the actual world outside of the asylum. Only after McMurphy arrives does Bromden discover that he was not the one who began his act of being deaf and dumb. The other patients and doctors in the ward began to treat him in this manner, and he accepted it. Throughout the story, he discovers that his participation in the charade has hampered his recuperation. The causes of Bromden's mental disorder are never explicitly revealed. It's likely he had PTSD from the war, or it was a persistent ailment from his youth. It is also plausible that, like McMurphy, he was sane when he entered the hospital, but that years of medication and treatment conspired to damage his mind. Randall McMurphy, a brash, loud, overly sexual red-haired Irishman. McMurphy is admitted to the hospital at the opening of the story and immediately begins to challenge the status quo. McMurphy serves as a foil for Bromden, who is repressed, and Nurse Ratchet, who is mechanical and sterile. McMurphy's freedom, sexuality, and self-determination collide with the subjugated ward right away. His outbursts and candor astound the other patients, who have grown accustomed to suppression and compliance. McMurphy is believed to have been arrested for statutory rape and then brought in unwillingly. We learn from Bromden's narration that McMurphy, who was originally ordered to work off his debt to society on a farm, got himself admitted to the ward in the hopes of having an easier stay. He regrets his decision after meeting Nurse Ratchet. McMurphy rapidly understands that Ratchet has the power to keep him in the ward indefinitely regardless of his release date. McMurphy's destiny is foreshadowed by the fate of another former patient, Tabor, who was subjected to electroshock and lobotomized after Nurse Ratched determined him to be a manipulator. Tabor became passive and vegetative as a result of this. Ratched compares the two patients early in the narrative, clearly foreshadowing what would happen to McMurphy by the end. In book evaluations, McMurphy's character is frequently compared to a Christ-like figure. This is due to the fact that when he is brought into the ward, he undergoes a form of baptism, the forced shower, swiftly gains followers, or disciples, and ultimately pays the price for the freedom of the rest of the men in the ward with his death. Nurse Ratched, 
the head nurse in the ward. A cold, mechanical, and seemingly cruel woman who treats her patients like animals. Ratchet isn't a clear villain from the start. She is not an enraged, power-crazed lady. In Bromden's Combine, she is a mechanical, quiet woman who epitomizes society's dehumanization. Because of her size, the patients on the ward often refer to her as Big Nurse, yet this is also a reference to George Orwell's 1984 and his totalitarian power, Big Brother. Ratched maintains her power over the ward in many respects as if she were a dictator, and the patient's downfall is referred to as a revolution in the book. Prior to the entrance of McMurphy, the patients would go out of their way to impress Ratched by disclosing their secrets as well as each other's secrets. This establishes her as an opposing mother figure to the ward. McMurphy ruffles Ratched's feathers by identifying and exploiting her weak points right away. He exploits his sexuality to frighten and confuse her and he refuses to give in to her phony compassion. Ratched is ousted at the end of the story, and it is revealed that since McMurphy overthrew her, she has never been able to regain control of the ward and regain her authority. Dale Harding, the former craziest patient in the ward before McMurphy's arrival. McMurphy instantly challenges Harding to a contest to discover who is the most mentally sick, and Harding swiftly succumbs, demonstrating how easily terrified the patients on the ward have become. Harding is the president of the patient's council and the ward's lone college graduate. Vera, Harding's wife, pays a visit and demonstrates that she is the dominant one in the relationship, humiliating him in front of the other patients. Another patient reveals to McMurphy that Harding may be a secret homosexual. Dr. Spivey is the ward's chief physician. Though he exudes authority, Spivey is readily duped by Ratched and McMurphy, who both utilize him to their advantage throughout the novel. Ratchet employs him to assist cement her power over the patients, while McMurphy employs him to overthrow her. Midway through the novel, Spivey serves as a chaperone on a fishing excursion. Spivey resigns and leaves the ward after the book's climax. Kenneth Elton Kesey was born in 1935 in La Honta, Colorado. As a child, he relocated to Springfield, Oregon with his family, the son of dairy farmers. Kesey graduated from the University of Oregon in 1957 and enrolled in Stanford University's Creative Writing Department in 1958. Kesey became a volunteer subject for drug trials at Stanford in the early 1960s. Primarily concerned with the effects of LSD. During this time, Kesey wrote his best-known work, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which he aided by working at a veterans' hospital. He became a successful author as a result of the book and he continued to experiment with psychoactive chemicals with the proceeds from his fame. Kesey was arrested for marijuana possession in 1965 and fled to Mexico after pretending to commit suicide. He returned to the United States eight months later and was detained again. He later served his sentence in prison. Sometimes a Great Notion, Kesey's second novel, was released in 1964. The rights to One Flu were purchased from Kesey for $20,000 in the early 1970s. While initially involved in the film's production, Kesey later quit the set owing to a disagreement over the money he was paid for the rights and casting. Kesey later stated that he never saw the film after it was completed. Despite this, the film went on to win five Academy Awards and is now regarded as a classic. Kesey married Norma in 1956, and the couple had three children, one of whom died tragically early in 1984. Kesey was diagnosed with diabetes in 1992, and by 1998, he was said to be quite feeble due to poor health and old age. Kesey underwent surgery in October 2001 to remove a tumor on his liver. The following month, at the age of 66, he died of complications from the procedure. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video.